Welcome to WOWL Comic Chat. And uh, with me today, as always, we have Hawkeye. Hey, 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 everybody. And we have Boomstam. Hello, people. And then we have DigiDax. What's up, Digi? What's up, fanboy? And so we uh, we have a lot to cover, right? And as always, I want to preference this. Um, there are tons of spoilers. So if you're stumbling on us for the first time, you're like, man, I really like the vibe so far on this 30 seconds that they've been going. Um, make sure I want you to understand that there is a ton of spoilers in this. Um, and then as always, if, if you're a listener and you're like, hey, I want to get on there and hang out and talk to some of these guys, um, let us know. Hit a boom stand and, uh, you know, we'll, we'll try to set something up for sure. Uh, so first up, we have, uh, you know, we had one of our one of the, the guys on here was able to spend some time, um, you know, at the Metropolis Convention. Um, and so did you want to kind of walk everybody through some of the cool things you saw and and heard and people you interacted with? Oh, yeah. Uh, every year, it's usually uh, the first weekend in June or maybe the second. But this year it was June 9th through 11th. Uh, 2023, the Superman celebration. I believe it was the 45th year, but they uh, had celebrity guests, Tyler Hoechlin, you know, from Superman and Lois, Nicole Maines and Jesse Rath from Supergirl. They played uh, Dreamer and Brainy, respectively. And the whole weekend was a bunch of, you know, fun activities like eating contests, costume contests, a lot of cosplay. Um, there were uh, just all kinds of different Superman events going on for kids, for adults. And um, I also uh, was in the eating contest. If anybody wants to see a picture of that, like I've got some video and of me wolfing down a big cheesecake with 200 M&Ms on it. That I uh, absolutely need to see that photo. And I think that eventually we need to have like a calendar of comic chat guys and of all of us like doing different things. And that should be one of the photos on there. Oh, absolutely. I also did spend a lot of money at an auction too, you know, uh, and was outbid by Sam T. Jones, the guy that played Flash Gordon. I have a picture of that as well. That sounds really cool. So any any cool conversations come out of it? I know you had some time where you could talk to some of some of these guys. Any anything big come out of it? I tried to get Tyler Hoechlin on, you know, just to get a sound bite for the show. Uh, unfortunately, he, under the WB contract, he couldn't do anything, I guess, talking about comic books without his agent's permission. We didn't get that. But I mean, he was a really cool guy. He actually listened. He actually listened to like a couple of uh, sound bites from the show and laughed. And it seemed like a genuine laugh. So I'll take that as a win. That is cool. Um, we have him as a new. We have we have him as a new regular now. <laughs> maybe maybe one day. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's that's really cool. Yeah, and you know, I, I'll say you know the uh, the Superman and and Lois show that you know that he that he's in. Obviously, I I really. Uh, really enjoy it. You know, a lot of the the Arrowverse stuff. Uh, you know, it was kind of hard, I think, to watch after the first few seasons. Like, started off great and kind of like tapered off. Um, but I've I've really enjoyed enjoyed his show. So so it's really cool that you got to go out there and meet him. Well, good deal. So we uh, so we wanted to start with that. After that, we have a a really. Um, big thing that happened. So we had the flash movie that, that came out. Um, seems like, you know, some mixed reviews, um, a little underperforming or, or a lot of underperforming at the box office. Um, personally, I, I at least bought tickets to see it. Um, even though I ended up not being able to make it that night because, uh, once my wife found out that it was something that on a Friday night, we weren't going to leave the theater till 2 AM. Um, she instantly kind of got um, uh, turned off by it. Like, hey, we're not doing that. And so at least I, 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 I did my part to help uh, the box office numbers. Um, so you guys won't be hearing from me a lot on the kind of the recap and what our thoughts are. But 
um, you know, Digi, Hawkeye, Boom, like what, what are your guys' thoughts on it? I'm going to let these guys speak first because uh, I did not particularly enjoy the movie. And I know that these guys uh, definitely had a different experience with it uh, from what I, from what from this talking. So, Boom, Digi, one of you guys want to throw, jump on there? Well, I, uh, overall, I, I thought it was uh, a nice movie. It was, you know, it went straight into action. It, uh, it showed the, the old uh, Zack Snyder universe uh, a little bit. You saw pretty much all the, the past uh, characters, you know, like Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman, uh, except for Cyborg, I think. You didn't see him. And you didn't see Aquaman at the start of the, of the movie. Uh, so it was uh, it was well paced. I, I liked the special effects. Uh, I liked the new suit that he had on. Uh, I liked uh, the way uh, 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 Ezra Miller played the uh, dual characters that he that he did. You know, he, he played two different versions of himself: uh, a younger version and a little bit of an uh, older version. So the the regular universe uh, version and the the one that he reset. Did you get, the, uh, get Did you get the goosebumps when Keaton puts on the bat suit? <laughs> yeah, that's what that was, that's what I was getting to. I really like the uh, the the old Batman, you know, Michael Keaton Batman uh, that they brought back. Back, I liked the whole Batcave and the the Batwing and the way he portrayed that character. It really felt like the you know like he uh, slipped back in an old uh, suit, if you will, you know, in an old robe. Um, so yeah, I, I really liked uh, his return. Didn't really like was the way that they ended the movie. Uh, I liked the uh, the cameos that they did, um, but you know, I, I think it could have been, I think it could have been more. I think it could have been better. Um, I think that you know that, that may have been part in you know it, it it's kind of rooted in the uh, in the Zack Snyder universe, and I'm. Kind of wondering if it would have done a little bit better if they, you know, if the Snyder universe was still on and and they kept it in that uh, in that kind of scene. You know, they could have uh, introduced Supergirl uh, next to Superman during this reset, um, but you know that would require the the uh, the old Snyderverse to to continue, and we know that's not happening. So um, I guess what I kind of expected it to happen was. Uh, I, I, I expected it to be a little bit more of a hard reset for the universe. You know, one where you can clearly see where they, they ended the, the Snyder universe and they're going to start something new with the uh, gun universe. And for me, that really, that didn't really happen as well as I had hoped. Uh, but, you know, overall, it was, it was an, an okay movie. So what you're referring to at the very end like Barry's on his phone and he's talking to Bruce. He gets out of his vehicle. You just see the shoes and then all of a sudden you see him walk up and it's George Clooney, Batman. You got, you got nipple, ba you got nipple the, Batman going. Yeah. You got nipple Batman. <laughs> and, but it went over well in the theater. I was in everybody got a good chuckle out of it. Yeah, It, 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 was, it was funny, was, but it was funny, but you know, at the same, yes, it was funny, but you, we all know he's not going to be the next Batman. Uh, you know, so it's it's kind of like, ha ha, uh, we're going to sh show you a, uh, you know, one of the most ridiculous Batmans we ever had. And we all know he's not going to be the, the next Batman or anything, you know. But ha ha, hopefully we don't have Ezra Miller back, though, too, right? Hopefully we have like a blonde, flat Barry Allen for like once, well, I guess. That, that's kind of what I, what, I, what, I, what, I, what I meant by the hard reset of the universe. You know, I I kind of wish that they you know really did a hard a hard reset just like they did in the in the comics with Flashpoint uh, because that's uh, that's easier to it's easier to go down and it's easier to replace all the characters and replace all the all the all the actors. You could get a blonde uh, Flash, you could get a, a blonde Supergirl, you could get a uh, uh, a new Superman, you could get a new Batman. New Aquaman, you know the whole the whole nine yards, uh, and it would have explained things better going into the gun universe, in my opinion. But you know, that's just me. 
I guess they could have ended it where he's looking in the mirror and doesn't recognize himself and uh, cut scene, but I guess they would have already had to cast their flash and they haven't. So Yeah, or even right, so never guys- never show him, right? And have like a, a TV screen on and it shows something of new other characters that might be cast or something. But I, I obviously I haven't seen it, but you know, I think that there's some cool ways that you could have ended it and kind of te- and kind of brought the two together. Right. And so, sorry, Hawkeye, I know I jumped in. Um, you're, you're fine. Burger. I was just going to say now that they got the sugar coating out of the way, um, I, I have to say the nicest thing I can say is that after the development, how the flash was in the fact that it was a compliment movie, uh, is probably the nicest thing I can say. Um, so first off, you know, it's a flash movie and you spend the first half of the movie and most of the middle part of the movie, really just the whole movie is him being a Robin, not actually being the flash. He's just running around doing Batman's work for him. Um, you have some of the worst CGI in a modern movie, and you could say that it was on purpose all you want, but uh, that's a terrible idea, and they shouldn't have gone with it. Um, it's a bastardization of the Flashpoint storyline. If you're going to do that storyline, it should have been the culmination. You should have had like the actual alternate dimension instead of this half-assed version of it that we got. Um, if you're going to do a Flash movie for the very first time, you know, maybe it should have some robes or grod or, you know, Zoom. He shouldn't be fighting Zod. So um, it was just a complete waste of time. Uh, and, and part of it is also I am not a big fan of the Snyderverse. Uh, I think that for the most part, there was one good movie from that entire generation of movies. Um, so maybe just playing around in that background didn't do it for me. You know, having Keaton in it was nice, but. You know, it's just a movie trying to ride on nostalgia instead of, you know, actually giving you something that's entertaining to watch. Yeah, you know, it's hard. You know, I so I've said this before, you know, on, on this podcast that, you know, DC does such a kick ass job with their animated movies. Like yeah, you watch those. They play off each other. Well, they flow into each other like their animated movies are kick ass and uh, you know a lot of like again like you know i've seen some things online you know obviously talked to a lot of friends hearing you guys um and it just seems like flashpoint is such a powerful comic i mean it really is like most dc fans like if you said you know rank your top 10 storylines that's generally probably going to be one of them and so there's so much like pedigree and power and everything that goes into that and then you have something that's that's disappointing this much. I mean, hell, like even if you look at, you know, Justice League Dark Apocalypse War, you know, at the end when, you know, they, like everything gets reset and you just kind of see like a, a you know, a, bl- a bright light kind of come and you, everybody's like, hey, you know, everything's restarting. Um, like it's like you could easily do things that that make this so much better or probably could have led to better results. But, you know, at the end of the day, I think it was kind of set up to struggle no matter what. I mean, like there's no doubt about it. There's nothing but confusion in the DCU, right? You know, there's whenever you look at, you know, uh, whether or not it's, you know, The Rock and, you know, his Black Adam stuff. And then, you know, talking about, you know, how he's, you know, trying to push his own thing. And then, you know, trying to give the people's elbow to everybody that's over there. Right. And then, you know, then you, it kind of flows into like other issues that are that have kind of happened and, you know, public breakups and, you know, the the and, and I know no bad press, like no press is bad press. Right. But, you know, having like all these big name stars that are like, hey, sorry, you're out not having anybody really that they're saying that's in. I mean, there's a ton of confusion. Um map that time down sorry <laughs> did you um there's a ton of confusion right that um that these guys you know the dc is is creating around its universe so i think naturally just going into the movie a lot of people are like hey you know it's what i have heard i'm not a big comic fan but what i am a big comic movie fan because there's a ton of those out there right you see that with marvel and dc and stuff in the past and it's just there's that confusion then there's the bad press that you get um, from Ezra Miller, who really like 
is a, I mean, really strong actor, but just personally, like, I mean, just like, man, like, gotta get that shit together. And, uh, but you have all of these kind of things, like, kind of pulling at each other. Like, it really doesn't surprise me that the movie didn't perform well. And then, you know, I read an article about the CGI. I know Hawkeye said, you know, they said they, they meant it to be that. But the CGI company, I mean, if I was the people that put that together, I would be like, hey, here's what's going on because most other people aren't going to be like, hey, I want to hire whoever did this, right? And so uh, the CGI company, I think one of the articles I read came out and said that um, we were rushed. We needed more than six weeks and and basically kind of like this was pulled and thrown together and we weren't given the ability to do what we really could have done. Um, and so I know that's kind of just my thoughts on this. But, you know, again, I think it just is a, such a big let down hearing some of these reviews and seeing the performance and then whenever you watch like the animated movies just how how great those usually are and and you know the hope of that you know we can capture some of that in the live action and, and that's one more thing i wanted to bring up and it's something i've mentioned before on, on this podcast and so we get to the point of james gunn's superman movie the box office numbers mean absolutely nothing um True. because you have you have a flash and then you have aquaman and blue beetle um all of them are remnants of the past decisions of the company they're just releasing them because they're an obligation at this point um they're trying to recoup whatever they can recoup um until we see what james gunn's movies do the box office numbers while Yes, they do have some effect. They aren't the normal what you would expect so, from from box office numbers. They don't have as much meaning. And to end on a bright note with that, one of my favorite parts was when he's in that universe where there is no Superman. Uh, he's talking about the movie Back to the Future, and the characters around him are like, "Oh yeah, the movie with Eric Stoltz in it," and they're like, "What? No, Michael J. Fox is the star." And they've never heard of Michael J. Fox. And Eric Stoltz is the Marty McFly of that universe. So that tells you how bad their universe was. <laughs> and a guy even has a Marty McFly, Eric Stoltz tattoo on his calf. And he calls it Marty McThigh. I, I don't know about you guys, <laughs> but funny. if there's no Michael J. Fox in the universe, I don't want any part of it. Yeah, it's pretty bad. <laughs> Agreed. Cool. Okay. Well, so uh, I, I guess if you guys had to, you know, rate it, you know, how would you guys, how would you guys rate it for everybody listening? If they're still on the fence, if they want to go out there and check it out, should they wait? Should they run, rush to the theaters after obviously finish listening to the podcast? Right. But once they finish listening to the podcast, should they run to the theaters or should they wait for it to come out or should they just skip it all together? What do you guys say? You're going to have to rush to the theaters. Because it's probably not going to last in there long. So if you want to see it. Yeah, it's it definitely a way for HBO Max. Okay. On a positive note, I did get two Flash cups. They were sold out of the uh, Flash uh, popcorn tins, but I did get the cups. So I think that is a win, too. There you go. Well, perfect. Oh, so sunny and positive. Thank you, Max. I appreciate it. Yeah. Yep. He's definitely the, the silver three, lining guy. He's definitely cups three fourths full. Um, so perfect. Okay. All right. So, uh, so now, you know, we want to kind of jump into, you know, last, last time we talked, you know, it's been a couple of weeks, you know, real life just popping up. Right. Uh, but it's been a couple of weeks since we all got together. So we had some comics that we missed last time. Uh, so we want to go through some of those kind of peripheral issues, like not the main ones that most people are reading, but we do want to touch on some of the, like the, the, I don't know how to like the, not as, mainstream characters and stuff. And so we want to kind of talk through those. Um, so Hawkeye, you want to, want to take over and run us through it? Yeah. Yeah. The first one was a uh, Batman Brave and the Bold, uh, which this is an anthology series, um, where it's just featuring, uh, smaller stories from with that, within the DC universe. Um, it, it had a really solid opening, uh, Tom King story, Batman and Joker, uh, kind of goes over their first encounter. Um, then it also has another one that's uh, Superman, um, or actually Stormwatch, which I really enjoyed. I really enjoyed Stormwatch when they rebooted for New 52, 
I really enjoyed them trying to integrate that into the DC universe as a whole, and I'm, I'm glad that they're revisiting that again. Um, I'm hoping that it sticks this time, however. And then there was also a Superman storyline where he is going on an adventure and finding a, he found a Dakota ring, and he finds a hidden temple in the mountains, and that's where this, this month's issue ended. Uh, and then there is a very weird Magna Batman story back up as the final part of this book that I, I personally didn't really care for. Um, they also did, had uh, Ravager was in that uh, Stormwatch. The Stormwatch. Yeah, Ra Ravager and uh, uh, Shadow from Green, the Green Arrow books, I believe, were the like two main universe characters in that in that team for the, for right now. Uh, it's led by uh, Mr. Bones from the Department of Extra Normal uh, Affairs. Yeah. DEO, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, it's it's definitely going to have potential. I'm excited to see where they go with it. I thought the art was really sharp in it. Um, then there was Unstoppable Doom Patrol number three, which this is a series, I, I believe it's a six-issue series, so I'm actually getting a little concerned that it has no real direction. Uh, and it's just going to be just a bunch of uh, just kind of screwing around, which is fine. Uh, that, that's going to make for a fun book, but uh, it doesn't seem to have like an overarching story. Yet. What, what did you guys think of this one with the uh, Unstoppable Doom Patrol three with the? Uh, oh yeah, Green it Lanterns. had the uh, the Green Lanterns, and it starts off by Guy Gardner saying <laughs> the Doom Patrol. So, <laughs> um, and it has Guy and Kyle following Negative Man and Robot Man trying to. Um, I guess get Starbro, a uh, Starro <laughs> guy, uh, to safety, and it's just about them trying to outrun the Green Lantern Corps until they can get to uh, their underground lair in Kansas, right? And you have to love the title of this issue is the Fast and the Nebulous. Yeah, and it also has the rest of the team fighting Animal uh, Mineral Vegetable Man, right? <laughs> yep. Yes, but yeah, I, I'm kind of wanting it to have more of a direction for the series. That would be my biggest complaint right now about that one. Um, moving on, we had City Boy, which is a uh, City Boy number one, which is part of the Asian American and Pacific Islander books that they've been releasing. I know that Boom, you said you weren't that crazy about this book, um, though I thought it had a really exciting ending. Uh, what, what were your overall thoughts on it? Uh, well, uh, yeah, I wasn't that excited. I was excited about the ending, uh, to be honest. Uh, that was the pretty much the only part that I liked. Uh, well, it's about a, a boy who has, I like, some uh, spiritual connection or something to, uh, like, uh, uh, all the cities. And he has... Uh, yeah, some kind of integration with the city. It kind of feels what the city feels, um, which kind of remind me of this character from the Stormwatch from the New 52, uh, who also had that uh, same kind of power. Yeah, yeah that guy. Uh, so I, I wonder if, if there's like a connection to, to that guy. Maybe he's his, he's his dad or something. Uh, but uh, it felt kind of like a weird uh, story overall. Not sure where it's going, but, you know, it's just the first issue. I got excited at the end because, you know, we get to see uh, Bruno Mannheim and his connection to Darkseid. And uh, it seems that Darkseid is uh, interested in the uh, in the City Boy character, probably for his powers. So, uh, yeah, I'm hoping to see uh, where that leads and uh, maybe that'll uh, make the book a little more interesting for me. But overall, I wasn't you know, that excited about the book as a whole. And then the uh, last thing under our quick headers here, uh, we have The Vigil, which again is another one of the uh, We Are Legend books. It's for Asian American and Pacific Islanders. Um, I got to admit, I was not impressed with the first issue. Uh, I was actually considering rather I wanted to pick up the second issue, but I was like, I'll give it one more issue. And I, I thought the second issue was actually kind of spectacular. Yeah, I agree. Gregory, did you did you have a chance to read this? Yeah, I, I actually um, I like both 
new of the oh, I, I actually like all three of the new titles um that they've come out with you know, also spirit world um and you know when i when i see vigil i mean i agree i think episode or the issue number one was a little slower kind of you know explaining a little bit but it was kind of hard kind of getting into um like a, a lot of like kind of how they got to where they are um but i think it did a, an, an okay job kind of tying in like who some of like the main players are um but the second one you know I, I think it's doing a good job of kind of adding in some suspense and you even like you have their team their core team and you have kind of like you know people internal saying like hey you know what does our leader know what is he not telling us um then at the end you see him in some sort of like astral plane or uh, other world or other dimension um walking around without his clothes on and you see his clothes just sitting in his office on the floor and so it kind of adds to that that there's something else going on here with him um but you know essentially you know the books are all about um there was a bunch like basically other countries were experimenting on people um to try to draw out either making um some sort of power set coming um, or drawing out some sort of latent ability that they may have. Um, and so there was a, a group within the government that was tasked with doing this. Um, you know, it was kind of failing. And so then they said, hey, uh, you know, we're cutting off your funding, get lost, um, which was all kind of part of um, this, this leader's plan. Um, so then he started kind of moving the chess pieces around, getting the right people in place. Um, and essentially they're, they're kind of going around and they're, um, you know, trying to, you know, stop bad guys, trying to, you know, right some wrongs. They, um, this second issue, you know, they kind of show up and they find uh, a, a child that's been, um, had like the, their powers pulled out that they can control weather. And they, they do a good job, I think, in kind of talking about how this happens and, how over you know the the centuries you know right of humankind you know we've had times where it's like hey you know rain dance or trying to uh, stop volcanoes and and just how powerful emotion and like just human emotions how they can come together and actually uh, affect uh, the weather and and kind of you know play off all that and then they explain how children have um, that's amplified. They haven't learned how to manage like their emotions really yet. Um, as they, as they do with adults where they kind of suppress certain things, certain urges, all that. And so children can absolutely tap into this a lot better. And so, and then they started finding some that were a little bit more, um, able to do those things. And, and so it kind of does a good job of showing one, how powerful this is and how powerful these groups are able to make it. Um, you see this child, um, who kind of just looks like he's walking around with like a, you know, JBL speaker on his head. Um, and you know, just, just straight out, like, um, kind of like the, the Thanos snap, you just see people kind of turn to ash, um, as he, as he kind of does this thing at him, um, goes outside, makes it rain. Um, literally making it rain not like he's sitting there throwing money in the air or anything oh um, i was thinking of making it rain the other way yeah um not not the not the more fun way um but so he so he goes out there you know makes it rain is able to control all that but but again i i do like it i like city boy uh, a lot as well I, I know we talked to boom about that a second ago but you know i, I think it's interesting how they're kind of creating um, these characters and how the, and the creativity that's going in behind it. Um, I do like a lot of the artwork. Um, and so I, I'm really, really liking all three of these new series so far. All right. So moving into our next subject here, uh, we all read a lot of comics, uh, but amongst us, one of us reads absolutely everything. Uh, Boom Sam. Uh, he has a few books that he has read that none of the rest of us are actually reading. So uh, we're just going to give him a couple minutes here to go over some of the stuff that uh, doesn't quite pique the interest of the rest of us, but uh, he's read. So, boom, why don't you go ahead and take it over? 
Uh, thanks. Um, yeah. Uh, the first one I uh, like to talk about is uh, Bad Girls. It uh, just ended with issue 19, just this uh, last week. Um, I like the uh, story about it. I know you uh, didn't really like the art about uh, from the books, uh, Hawkeye. Uh, I thought the art wasn't art wasn't that bad. It wasn't great, but it wasn't that bad. Uh, what I like about the books is um, it's a fresh new book. It's uh, it's something that they haven't done at DC before. You know, in the, in the past we had like. Uh, Batman version one and version two and version three and same goes for Bad Girls and other characters. You know, we had, they had uh, the the first uh, either retire or something and they replace it with another one. Uh, same with Bad Girls. We first had Barbara, then we had uh, Cassandra after she was uh, shot by uh, the Joker, and then after Cassandra we had uh, Stephanie. And uh, what I liked about this book is that you know they. I'll bring it together. Uh, we have the three bad girls being bad girl, you know, Barbara's bad girl again, thanks to the implant in her back. Uh, uh, Cassie's bad girl and Stephanie's bad girl, and they're all working together. So it, it really feels like it's all coming together with the uh, with three versions of bad girl. Uh, it also has a big uh, birds of prey kind of vibe for me because you know bad girl uh, Barbara is uh, being bad girl, but she's also uh, being Oracle, so she is uh, uh, leading the team, not as big as the Birds of Prey team, but still she's uh, uh, coaching the, uh, the the other two bad girls from, uh, from behind the computer, if you will. So it, it really feels like a bad girl book and also feels like a Birds of Prey book. Uh, maybe a little bit of a Titan feel. You know, I, I really thought that was uh, pretty good. And it's an interesting story about... Uh, a neighborhood called The Hill, pretty much like uh, she was uh, from the New 52. You had Barbara uh, being in the, the, the neighborhood called The Burnside. So it kind of had a, a feel for that too. So it really, to me, it felt like all the past stories from Bad Girls and Birds of Prey coming together in one uh, story arc, if you will. I do like, I mean, I, I thought the book was enjoyable. I would prefer if they actually called Stephanie spoiler, maybe Cassandra Cain, call her orphan. I mean, like if they go, hey, Batgirl, and all three of them turn around at the same time. Yeah, I was I was actually sure just thinking they that. They all have the same code name. Yeah, I was just thinking well, that, that also. And that was that was explained because before the Batgirls book, they, they, they all have been in different uh, books and different stories. Uh, Cassandra was orphan. Uh, but they added the bad logo later, and uh, Stephanie was spoiler because she was uh, rebelling against uh, Bruce uh, for some other reason. Um, and uh, when they became the Bad Girls, she also changed from spoiler to Bad Girls and added the bad logo to her to her to her uh, outfit. Yeah, uh, it, it, it it they do have different costumes and the different versions yeah. of it. I mean, which is good. I just. I kind of wish they would have different code names. I do like them all being together in the same book and same team. I would just prefer the different code names of this. Yeah, I, 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 I get, I understand what you, what you mean, and I, I think, I think I agree, sort of. But I also kind of like the idea that they're all bad girl. Um, it was also at the end that they, they all said, you know, we are all bad girls. So the, the, the whole community, the whole neighborhood rallied behind them. I thought that was kind of, uh, kind of cool. Uh, I also thought it was very nice that they uh, resolved uh, the the daddy issues that they had, you know, because Cassandra was trained to be a weapon by her father, and you know she confronts her mother, uh, Lady Shiva, uh, about their issues, and Stephanie confronts her father, uh, Clue Master, about uh, about her issues that she had with her father, and uh, yeah, I thought that was I thought that was pretty cool. I thought that they ended it. Uh, very well. Her issue is like, hey, dad, why are you a second rate Riddler? <laughs> yeah, something like that. So uh, that for Bad Girls. Uh, the other books that I wanted to talk about was uh, the Batman One Bad Day books. I think eight 
ish. Let me check. Yes, eight books from different uh, Batman villains, and uh, it's uh, Bane, Catwoman, Clayface, uh, Mister Freeze, Penguin, uh, Rachel Ghoul, Riddler, and Two Face. And what I liked about those books was it had a really unique background story or uh, current story about those characters. You know, it's either about uh, how they came to be or why they are doing the things that they do uh, in their relationship to Batman uh, and into in, the, in their relationship to other villains. And uh, it really gave, gave me an uh, like an in-depth uh, view into their you know into their psyche, into their uh, into their mind. And uh, yeah, it's it's a really uh, that they're really cool cool individual stories that you could just you know, pick up and just read anytime, you know, you don't have to have any backstory about the characters or about the, the stories that, that you're reading. So they're nice little standalone books that I just recommend to anybody who's either uh, a Batman fan or, uh, you know, just a regular comic book fan and want to uh, dive into the uh, Batman universe a little bit. Um, so, yeah. yeah. It's supposed to be like the basically each individual character's version of the killing joke essentially i think was how they were pitched did it live yeah. up to that or mm, not so much not exactly i mean some more than others i guess um but i i've only read the riddler out of these and that one was definitely uh kind of like a short form uh version of the riddler's kind of Killing joke type of story. Yeah, I, I'm. I mean, I like the Riddler story. I, I, it would. It, I just didn't really like the the the. You know, maybe that's just you know uh, my problem with uh, with comic books. You know, I just prefer that uh, good uh, wins out over evil, and you know, Batman just uh, outsmarts uh, every uh, bad guy that he uh, that he finds. And uh, in this book, it was kind of like that the Riddler was better, uh, smarter than Batman. And, you know, he kind he was kind of toying with him. Uh, uh, so I didn't really enjoy that part. But um, overall, it was it was nice. I really liked the Clayface book uh, where you got to see, you know, all the different aspects of all the people that he absorbed and that he... Uh, took over their uh, characteristics and, and, and you know, the, the way he, he needs uh, validation from uh, from an audience and everything, you know, you could really see that he's uh, an, an, an actor at heart. And that, I, th I think that really shined through. Uh, also for Rachel Ghoul, you know, you see the pretty much the eternal struggle that they have and the mutual respect that they have for each other, you know, between Raish and, 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 and Batman. Uh, also in this book, Raish sort of wins from Batman. Uh, but it's at the same time, it's, it's not really, it's not really about the winning or the defeating. It's, 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 you know, it's, it's the respect that, that shines through between those two adversaries. I thought that was, uh, that was really cool. What other books did you have? Any? Well, I, I, I did, but, uh, you just told me I couldn't talk about that one. That that was, uh, the Dark Knights of Steel. That's one of, probably one of my favorites. Uh, yeah, I sorry if there, sure it, we... Well, we're at Talk 11 right now, point. right? Right. Um, they're on issue 11 out of 12 right now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We, 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 yeah we're going to we're gonna wrap that up when the last issue is going to come out. But, you know, if anyone is listening and wants to get on, get on that, you know, I can't recommend that enough. But, you know, more on that the next uh, episode, I guess. It is now a good time for me to talk to <laughs> Marvel stuff? No. no, no. <laughs> it says comics chat, but it's not a comics chat. It's a DC comics chat. <laughs> Leave that stuff at the door where it belongs. So for all the listeners out there, <laughs> I'm the only one that reads uh, Marvel ones. So I read almost all Marvel and most almost all DC every week. Hey, the other DC Disney comics. Oh yeah, exactly right. <laughs> all right. So um, we, we did have three books that we did not touch on because we had the Power Girls special, Superman Lost Number Four, and DC Pride. I just want to take some time real quick to talk those over and give them a chance to talk on them. Uh, and if you guys want to add anything, you can. Perfect. Okay, so I so I've read two of those. Um, 
so I I'm a I am really big fan with Superman Lost. Um, the only thing that I didn't really like about the first few issues was that it seemed like we were constantly explaining it like it was the first issue of hey Superman's lost again. Here's how it happened. Every time he ends up on a new world, you're hearing the same kind of spiel. Um, but outside of that, I love the way that it goes with, um, you know, Superman, despite his powers and despite like what we've seen him do in recent comics, um, like just him being so absolutely far away that it's like, how is he going to possibly make it back um, to Earth? But you see flashes of him um kind of losing hope and actually being in despair while he's lost. And then you see flashes of him interacting in the present um, and like Lois needing to remind him to breathe. And then him being like, sorry, you know, I just got so long for used to holding my breath for so long. Like this is just my natural state now, basically. Um, and so I, so I am liking it. I'm liking, you know, his interactions and how it's kind of setting it up to where, you know, there's some planets out there that, you know, are being oppressed and um, him kind of interacting with those individuals, um, you know, on, on the one planet that he ends up making his way back to, um, you know, he kind of has like a familiar cast kind of popping up, right? Like he makes it back to this planet. Um, it's been several years since he was there because he's been traveling back and forth uh, through the universe. Um, and then, and so like the individual that he first met with is, is older, um, and, you know, kind of seeks him out. Then he finds out that some of the other people that he first interacted with that had offered to drop him back off at his planet. Um, and it originally dropped him off here, um, how they were there and they were kind of pillaging the planet. Um, and so his interactions with them. And so I, I do, I really am a big fan of Superman Lost and how it continues to show like the human side of him um, and just everything that like anybody would go through, like being that far um, away from anybody else they know, not really knowing which direction is north and just trying to find any way to get back home. And so... So I, I actually really like this limited series for sure so far. Yeah, I uh, I really like the, you know, how, how their story is a little bit more, you know, I don't know how else to call it, but, you know, a little bit more grounded in reality, you know. I mean, I know it's a comic book and I know it's it's all fictional and everything, but, you know, it just really shows that even for a Superman, the universe is a very big place and you can easily get lost in it and you can easily lose your way in it. And, uh, you know, it's, it's like a tiny, tiny dot in the great, big, vast expanse. And, you know, I think that's really just, you know, shows how he uh, has to use the gravity of other uh, suns and, and planets and everything to fling his, himself uh, towards uh, great speeds. You know, the last time with the dolphins and now you see him riding uh, some, universe, uh, some meteors. Uh, so I, I thought that was really nice to... to you know, I have them a little bit more uh, grounded that way. Uh, I also like that, you know, it uh, really shows how uh, how he went after his uh, his original suit and how much that means to him because, you know, his, his mother uh, made it for him and you get a flashback to, to, to that that part. Um, I also like that he came back to the planet to, to kind of like fix the, the problems that, uh, that, ha- that, that, that he saw. You know, it, it kind of bothered me with the first issue that he he landed on that uh, planet and he knew there were things going on, but, you know, he was in such a hurry to, to get out of there and, 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 you know, didn't really stay and help the, uh, the inhabitants of that, that world. Um, and I like that, you know, the interaction that he had with the, the, the Superman of that planet, it, it's called, he's called uh, Victor and, and he doesn't really want to help uh, the uh, inhabitants of his world because they don't really want to be helped. And I thought that made for an interesting, you know, moral uh, conundrum where, you know, uh, you really have to ask yourself, you know, do I really want to save people who don't really want to be saved? And are they therefore uh, more or less deserving of, of, of saving? And, you know, 
as Superman, he just uh, does what he does and he ends up fighting the uh, the uh, small aliens that they're that are pillaging the planet. And you know, he he he's going to do what he thinks is uh, what he thinks is right. And I think that's why we all uh, love Superman because you know, in the end, he always tries to do the right thing. Did you uh, right. have you seen the? preview of issue number five cover i have not getting fresh with the green lantern yeah yeah I, I heard something about that if, um i mean i was talking to to digi about it earlier if that's really i don't know how it will play out so i'll have to you know reserve judgment for uh, uh you know for when i actually read the comic book but you know you can clearly see how uh he is with lois before this all started, you know, because it all started with the uh, submarine going haywire and, and, and the, the just using the the lasso of truth as a, a anchor to anchor himself and and you know try to to save him. Uh, if it turns out that he does, you know, uh, date this new Green Lantern woman, I think that would feel to me at least like a betrayal of Lois. So I'm you know not sure how that will will pan out and what the story is actually going to be like. But uh, if they do go that way, I don't think I'm going to be happy about it. I think could, that, it, it could show could why Superman of earth 33 and a third. And it's, well, he, it's playa Superman. He's like, what's well, up? <laughs> even, <laughs> even so, play, really, play a man. It, really, it, it would, it would betray the image of Superman for me at least. But you know, I, well, it could explain why he's kind of distant from Lois, right? Because all of their interactions, like it's like her saying, talk to me, what's going on? And, you know, him him not really opening up. Like you yeah, can he's definitely like, oh, see. Oh, damn, I already had this Green Lantern. Exactly. <laughs> um, and so so it could explain why his, why his relationship with her is a little strained. I, yeah, yeah, but I don't, well... You know, I'm, I maybe I'm I'm putting him on a bigger pedestal than I maybe should have, but uh, I don't think he would do that to Lois. But you know, that's just me. But we'll see what happens when the uh, the next issue comes out. Cool. And so, what was the the second comic you want to talk about, Boom? Well, there were there were there were two more actually. There was the Power Girl special. I don't know if any of you guys uh, read that. I did. I uh, I like seeing Johnny Sorrow again. You know, it feels like we haven't seen him in a long, long time. You know, he's always been of a kind of like the bad guy for the JSA, and uh, uh, Power Girl was part of the JSA uh, back in the day. I like the twist with her powers. You know, because of the Lazarus uh, reign, uh, I think I do like her. You know, regular powers a little bit more. I think it was nice that you know she was put in the spotlight a little bit more, where she had to rescue the Super Family this time instead of being rescued and I liked it that you know she uh returns to the fold with the Superman family again because in the uh other issues you know the the backup stories from uh, action comics it really felt like she was she was putting herself uh a bit of the on the back row of the the, the super family she was you know kind of making herself into like the black sheep of the family which to me, she really wasn't. She was always part of the Superman family for me, and uh, I like that. Uh, that has been restored in this in this Power Girl special again. To me, it all it felt like you know all is well in the Superman family again with Power Girl back in there. Also, I like the uh, the backup for the Power Girl special with uh, Fire and Ice, how they are uh, uh, on their way to to Smallville, and they're going to have their own comic book. Uh, where they are uh, going to have adventures in in Smallville, and you know, I wonder how that will uh, tie in with the rest of the Super uh, Family, if there is any connection at all. I like seeing uh, Guy Gardner again. He was really being a uh, you know obnoxious guy again. Uh, he tried to help, but it didn't really help. He you know it did more harm than good. Uh, I like that uh, interaction between. Uh, both ice and him and also fire and him, you know, uh, fire being still being a little, you know, uh, you know, he's my boyfriend or ex boyfriend and, you know, fire like being, you know, he's just a jack. What do you see in that guy? So, uh, it was a, a nice, funny little 
backup story, nice artwork, nice story, and I'm you know looking forward to their solo uh, run of their new number one coming out. Oh yeah, Fire and Ice heading to Smallville. To yeah, take a break. Yeah, and, and I like the reference of uh, you know them 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 trying to, uh, them uh, looking forward to having uh, some of uh, Mark Kent's uh, apple pie. You know, like it's you know the most famous thing in Smallville or something. That was kind of funny. Yeah, no, I, I like the fact that you know we have you have somebody in the Superman family kind of showing a like a little different power set and something that generally is a weakness for them and having this i like the fact that you know, at the end you know she fully realizes that she is a part of this family and everything that she was feeling was in her head um i really really liked the interaction of her and the original superman from earth 2 um yeah. before everything happened when it, it even though it was just you know somebody that was like a version of him inside of her mind and kind mm-hmm. of walking her through stuff so I, so I thought it was, I, I, I thought like a lot of this issue um, w- was really cool. And it kind of you know highlighted some different stuff, ultimately ended with her feeling more part of the family, which is great. Um, and so I, I really enjoyed reading it. Cool. And the last uh, book that I wanted to talk about was uh, the DC Pride book. I don't know if you guys read that. I have not. Well, it's, uh, it's a big, um, what do you call it? It's, a, it's one book with all smaller uh uh little Impact. stories uh, yeah so uh there's there's different uh stories with different characters um there were some that i liked some that i didn't like most of them i didn't really uh care for the ones that i did like was um the the one with harley and ivy and uh crush they were uh like stuck on an island and you know harley wanted to play like the mother of of crush and um you know trying to baby her and keep her on the island and you know kind of like you know make 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 house on the family you know and the, the way that that it was portrayed and the way she she explained it and everything that, that was kind of funny especially because you know on the internet it's been uh, a bit of a rumor about who crush's mother is and you know, uh, Harley was one of the, you know, candidates of, of, you know, potentially being, being her mother. So I thought that was kind of like a, a funny, uh, kind of reference. Uh, the other one that I liked was with, uh, uh, John Kent and, uh, Constantine. They were, uh, like having a bet. He was, uh, Constantine was having a, a bet with, uh, Felix Faust about, uh, who would, uh, beat who. One of John's uh, self-created uh, monsters. I'm not really sure what the what the monster was called, but it was like a, a swamp kind of monster. And uh, John had to fight him, and they, they 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 were you know placing bets about who would uh, who would win. You know, John uh, Constantine uh, bet that uh, his monster would win against uh, against John. And Felix uh, obviously bet uh, the other way around. You know, John had to uh, fight this monster, and well, it turns out he uh, he had to throw the fight so uh, Constantine could win the bet, and uh, you know, save save somebody. So yeah, that was uh, that was that. Was, those were like the two stories that I that I liked best uh, from from that book. It does feel like there's an uh, another issue uh, coming for this. Uh, there was the the DC Pride one shot from a while back, but this is uh, another uh, book, and it, uh, all, by, almost all of the little stories had like to be continued in them. So there's probably going to be another issue where uh, the the story is going to pick up. So you know, if you're into that, you could you, you can pick that up and you can start because it's just uh, the first issue that's that's out now. So uh, so yeah, cool. All right, so <laughs> this was a um, obviously great time as always hanging out with you guys and uh, being able to you know, spend time talking about all the things that we love. <laughs> Thank you.
while, last episode with Burger, Hawkeye, and Boomstam. And Digi. And Digi. <laughs> this is part two of episode seven. Uh, Digi, Burger, I, I have a quick pop question for you guys to make sure you guys are awake, locked in, ready to go. Uh, if you guys could recommend any one run or just one storyline to, to the listeners, what would it be? It could be any book. Doesn't have to be an ongoing. Could be just something you love from from the past. Oh. Did you let's start with you? Current, current ongoing or no, current no, book? no. It can be anything. Anything that you've ever read that you would just recommend to people. Oh, anything I've ever read. I would have to go with Green Lantern Rebirth, Jeff Johns. I think it's a masterpiece. Fantastic choice. Absolutely agree with you. Definitely a masterpiece. I, I think a. A hugely slept on part of that is the uh, Green Lantern Corp uh, companion book that was written by Peter Tomasi. It was also absolutely excellent. Oh, oh yeah. Amazing. To the universe. Uh, Burger, how about yourself? And don't you bring that Marvel crap up. <laughs> um, you know, I think, damn, there's a, there's a lot of good ones. I'm trying to think of the ones lately that I've probably enjoyed the most. Probably, you know, one one that I really like, um, just because I, I think it it kind of does a really good job of showing what could happen and how much influence would happen if Superman decided, kind of, hey, you know what, enough's enough. Um, which I think is um, uh, the Injustice um, comics and. You know, the funny thing is I've never actually even played the game, um, but I I really enjoy that, those comics and when it shows, hey, you know what, Superman kind of has enough, he's pushed to his breaking point um, of the Joker, and when he's just like, you know what, like, I've, I've, I've sit here and I've tried to inspire you guys, I've tried to do all this stuff, and, you know, now, you know, this kind of stuff keeps happening, and, and I'm tired of it, which is... Part of the reason why, you know, I think I, I like so much of you know, Superman, John Kent, um, that's going on. But I would say I would say Injustice. Another excellent choice. Uh, my favorite thing about the Injustice run was just uh, all the crazy places they took each. Like, you know, I think they called them seasons uh, where each season, you know, it was somebody else was trying to take down the regime and. In failing, you know, you know, one time it was the Green Lanterns, one time it's the Magic users, so on and so forth. I, I just really enjoyed how wide of a scope that series took. So definitely agree with you there. And you should, you should definitely play the game, though. Uh, it does a great narrative. It really shows the characters. Even the opening sequence of the game shows you everything you need to know about the story. I already have oh, one DC guys. game breaking my heart, though, all the time. <laughs> uh, I was going to ask you which one, and then it clicked with that. Well, this game doesn't, it doesn't make you spend thousands of dollars every week and sink a lot, that much time into. You could really get a quick in and out with the Injustice games. Cool. Yeah, Injustice, it's like a day worth of gaming. You know, It's like six, seven hours, and you can get through the story. Okay. All right, so let's dive back into some more books. Um, first off, we have the wrap up of the Wonder Woman run that's been going on. Um, we got an excellent storyline uh, that kind of uh, mimics the uh, whatever happened to the Man of Tomorrow and whatever happened to the Cape Crusader, and uh, we we got whatever happened to the uh, Warrior of Justice. Uh, Boom, I know you, you've been a pretty big fan of this storyline. Do you want to kind of sum it up and get the ball going? Yeah, sure. Uh, well, it's, uh, it takes place after uh, uh, the events of Lazarus Planet, uh, where she uh, got like new divine powers from uh, the Marvel family. and uh, Marvel she- family? What? <laughs> and uh sorry <laughs> the Shazam family uh and um she <laughs> was she was uh uh how do you call it um uh, pulled into the uh divine you know she's now a uh literal goddess 
Uh, so she's, she's, she's part of the divinity now. She's a, a god of something. We don't really know what yet. Um, and uh, it ends up with uh, Wonder Woman 799, where she's, uh, where you have all the characters from her life that are uh, dreaming about uh, different uh, stuff that happened or that they wish to happen with uh, Diana. Um, so you have like uh, Edda Candy, who's dreaming about having a picnic with uh, all the golden girls and uh, with Diana. And uh, then Cheetah comes comes along like a... Uh, B. Arthur older. and Rue McClanahan are in that? The golden girls? <laughs> <laughs> no, the, the 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 band that they're traveling. Oh, with. okay. It's like, <laughs> man, I need to read. <laughs> I need to reread that. Um, Betty Betty White and Estelle Getty. Hey. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, if you read Wonder Woman uh, Sensational Comics or something, I don't know what it's called again, but you know, they, there was a whole run of that with, uh, you know, like the. Uh, the band or the, the the women from the uh, uh, I don't know 1970s 80s or something. Uh, I think there was a reference to that uh, where you have the uh, uh, the dream of uh, what's he called the the Viking guy who's uh, dreaming of uh, endless fighting with uh, Diana by his side. You have a dream of of Steve who dreams of uh, being rescued by Diana again. Uh, so uh, and and that continues into uh, Wonder Woman number uh, well not exactly because at the end of seven ninety nine you see Diana sleeping and the the oracles that they had from the from Themyscira they are unable to to wake her up and uh, it turns out that uh, in uh, issue eight hundred she put herself in that state and more of those dreaming are are uh, continuing but now they are affecting her. Her, her family, if you will, it starts with uh, all the Wonder Girls and uh, how they relate to, to Wonder Woman, how they see her and how Wonder Woman sees them. And then it turns into uh, her friends and uh, co-workers from the Justice League. So you see uh, her kind of like invading Bruce's dreams or nightmares. Uh, but while she does that, she also uh, consoles or, or uh, comforts Bruce uh, in, in a dream. And, you know, you see Bruce Wayne uh, waking up and, you know, being a little bit better for it. And it, it, it turns out that it's all, you know, just Diana trying to cope with uh, being a, a goddess uh, again. So, yeah, it was a cool, cool story arc. Yeah, I did like that they had, um, you know, Yara Floor... Uh, Cassandra, they had Donna Troy and Artemis, you know, all of her former partners and sidekicks, you know, one back to back. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I, I, I really liked it. You know, I um, think the artwork was great. I like how it kind of changed um, based on how each person kind of sees her and what their relationship's like. Um, so I love that. You know, I think it really kind of shows um, a lot of like, you know, like her legacy and, you know, how she has impacted so many of these people in different ways. Um, so so really, really enjoyed it. But one thing that stands out to me, I mean, did you, did you guys think it was weird, like her and kal or her and Superman's Embrace kind of interaction? They had? Yeah. Yeah, it felt a little bit yeah. like New on 52. The romantic side. Yeah. yeah, it felt like New 52, like kind of coming yeah. back. Yeah. Um, so, like, I, hey, I did, where, are you, where are you going with this, baby? <laughs> exactly. I, I, I did like the story. You know, it, it did really, you know, give us also a bit of an uh, interesting point of view of Superman because, you know, it was, all, was about, you know, how he hears everything. He hears all the uh, cries for help and all the. Uh, tears and all the joys and everything from, you know, around the world. And he, he has to cope with that. I thought that was pretty, uh, pretty nice, was pretty insightful. And I kind of like how uh, Diana helped him, uh, you know, gain a little perspective on that and, you know, 
talk to him about that. And because she was, she's like one of the only persons that can, uh, you know, understand how he, how he feels and how he, how he is. I thought that was pretty nice how they wrote that. Yeah. And you see that same side of Superman in Superman five, right. That, that came out and, you know, kind of like some of like the relief that he had from that. So, so you can tell like, this is something that's weighing on him that, you know, always responsible all the time, needing to pick and choose. What am I going to do? Um, and basically saying, when do I intervene? When do I not? How do I prioritize these? So I, so I did like, I really liked that and, and like how it showed him a lot. Um, and that, and that's part of it. Yeah. yeah I, I think it did a really good job encapsulating her relationships with, uh, the other two members of the Trinity for, 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 for sure. Um, yeah. speaking of Trinity, and yeah, sorry, <laughs> what happened? Oh, I thought you, I thought you were, Oh no, it was, I think boom was what? jumping in. That was our nice little, not so subtle segue. Uh, speaking of Trinity. Yep. <laughs> Thank you for picking up on that. Deji. Uh, boom. You had something else that you wanted to say though. Yeah, I was going to jump on the uh, Trinity uh, thing because, you know, we haven't talked about the uh, backup in the in this issue about, uh, well, you you called it uh, Trinity or uh, Elizabeth, how she's really called, uh, or Lizzie, as uh, John and uh, Damien call her, who is the uh, daughter of uh, Diana. And uh, they, uh, they meet up, uh, or she meets up with... Uh, the adult versions of uh, John and Damien on uh, the island of Themyscira. Uh, she kind of keeps the boys waiting and they have to go into a mysterious cave and do some uh, challenges, if you will, to gain entry uh, or have, you know, Lizzie gain entrance to the, uh, to the cave. Uh, Superman has to hold the hand of a statue but endure uh, uh, great pain, and Damien has to uh, fight like a uh, legendary Spartan female Themysciran whatever a warrior for endless battle. Uh, so they're like trials of uh, pain. Uh, what was the other one? Uh, yeah. Skill, yeah, and honor. And uh, Lizzie's gonna do the uh, honor test and she uh she meets some some guy who we don't know who he is yet in a prison who is well it seems like she he is going to uh spin a tale about uh how he was defeated by her mother uh diana and probably why he's in that uh themiscure and uh jail so i'm uh I'm interested to see how uh, that will play out, who who her father uh, ends up uh, being and who that guy in the, in the prison is. Yeah, well, I think the like the, the story... Captain Nazi. Oh, you think it's Captain Nazi? No, no, I'm, oh. I'm just joking. Yeah, so, you know, I, I think the story that she was looking for is like her origin story, right? Like, you know, who's her dad and how'd all that happen? And he's basically like, look, like I'll do... I, I know your mother's trying to keep this a secret, so I have no problem, you know, kind of blowing this wide open. Um, and so I, I, I think it could be Maury yeah. Povich. I think it could be. <laughs> and boom is the father. Um, <laughs> so so uh, I, I liked it. You know, I, I know we were kind of talking about it a little bit before. Um, I, I do, I did like this. I, I liked how she was kind of, how she was kind of, I don't want to say balancing, but you know, how she was like holding her own and basically pushing, um, John and Damien forward. The only thing I did not like about this was, well, there, I guess there's two things. One was kind of minor, or I guess both were kind of minor. I really was not a fan of Damien's outfit of being Batman. Um, I, I'm like, what, like, when you think of Batman, you think of like stealth, being able to move freely, like all that. And he's wearing this massive, like, it seemed like Batman meets football player um, outfit, you know, huge shoulder pads. Like, I, I'm just like, I don't, I don't get it. Um, like, I don't even know how he would fit in the Batmobile with that. Um, 
that kind of sums up Damian Wayne for me as a character, anyways. Okay. <laughs> well, I, that's pretty much I, his canon look. For yeah, but it, yeah, that's that. I was going to say that it's pretty much the look he had. If you see a future of Damian, you pretty much always see that kind of suit. I do want to add that you know, with that suit, it always kind of implies that he's some some sort of evil Batman, or at least it it was. So I would have liked. Well, a, a little way, bit of a different look for him, but you know that's just me. Well, well, the thing is, is it, it's him paying um, um, tribute to both sides of his his family. It's the 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 player collar and everything. That's like League of Assassins, and then the, the the actual bat suit that would be, of course, Batman. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's just him him paying respect to his to his heritage. Essentially, is what the suit represents. Yeah. Yeah, I guess, but you know, if we 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 know this kind of suit, and then, you know, it would have been cool to see like a new, uh, a new concept for the suit or a new uh, Damian Wayne version of of Batman. To me, but you know, I, I can live with uh, what they've done so far. The uh, only thing that I didn't really like was her attitude. I like the character and I like the mystery around it, but uh, you know, she was a little bit. Uh, how do I call it? A little bit uh, uh, bra- brazen Amazon. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I, I did like the reference that John and Damien used to babysitter. Uh, I thought that was kind of funny, uh, but you know, I didn't really care for her, her uh, attitude towards both Damien and uh, John. Right. Any last words on this uh, Wonder Woman issue, guys? Or this, this group of Wonder Woman issues? Nope. All right. So I'm going to do a quick jump here, guys, and I want to tackle Batman 136. Um, Digi, do you want to break that one down for us? Yeah, sure. Um, so Batman 136, he's just gotten back from all his portal jumping, multiverse jumping, and uh it starts with Mr. Terrific checking him out, making sure he's okay. And then all of a sudden we see, oh, Batman Zurinar in his head. He's having this conversation like, I'm the Batman and you need me to be strong. So he's he's got this inner conflict going on. And then um, Tim seems worried about him, which I don't know if anybody's noticed, but Tim Drake is looking younger and younger. He almost looks like he could be younger than Damien. So they get a tip. Uh, Batman goes to face the the Penguins kids, Aiden and Addison Cobblepot. He gets in a fight with them. He kind of narrates it like, you know, Aiden was stronger than he thought. He wants to, since he had that bad interaction with multiverse Catwoman, you know, that kind of betrayed him. He wants to talk to Batman. All right, he wants to talk to Catwoman. She reassures him, hey, that's, you know, that wasn't me. You kind of get a sense of, you know, he's kind of getting back to basics here. Then he gets an alert saying, hey, someone's breaking into the the Batcave or, you know, the mansion. He goes there and then he has a a couple of lighthearted moments with his family. You know, they all show up. Tim Drake, Jason Todd, Stephanie, Dick Grayson, uh, Damien's there, Cassandra Cain, um, Duke Thomas, you know, the signal. They're all there. They're eating. And then it goes to, like, his mind, and it, he sees that they're all on fire. So it's kind of like he's got this whole inner struggle and that Batman Zurin R is like in his head now. Yeah, I, th- I think it's really interesting that they're kind of setting it up as fail safe by malfun- malfunctioning was uh, was actually going to trigger fail safe to need to be activated because Batman's definitely losing it at this point. Yeah, I, I want to see how they're going to rein him back in and kind of get him back to uh, back to level, essentially. He uh, still I, is missing his hand. You know, he's got his, I guess, cybernetic hand, which he doesn't let on. I, one of the Robins, I, maybe it's Tim, asked him, hey, we're wearing uh, gloves at the table. And he's like, oh, it was injured. But I don't, he doesn't want any of them to know, like, what's going on with him. 
Batman can't have any weaknesses. Um, overall, you know, I think this was a little bit of a filler issue. It was just kind of uh, moving things along to kind of keep the storyline going. A little bit of a, a table setting for the Gotham War event that they they've been te- that they started teasing this month. Um, so overall, I thought it was you know an okay issue. I, I thought it had some nice moments, especially with the Bat family. But overall, it was kind of a meh kind of issue. Yeah, it seemed like um, kind of a quick reset, right? Like, you know, like you said, they're setting the table for the next event, like that multiverse jumping never happened. All right, guys. So um, moving it along here, uh, we have John Kent number four. Um, very nice issue. Uh, really enjoying the uh, return to injustice. Uh, Burger, do you want to break that issue down for us? Oh, yeah. So I, you know, again, like I love Injustice, obviously, we talked about. And I, I love watching John Kent um, enter the Injustice world, you know, because he very much, um, uh, he, uh, while Superman always stands for truth, justice, hope, all that kind of stuff, like John really kind of personifies that. And I feel like a lot of times kind of brings it more human. Um, and so I think having him, over in this world it'll be interesting to see like what kind of impact he has and so you know this episode this I keep wanting to say episode this this issue um is all centered on um you know him trying to find out kind of you know what what's going on in this universe and you know what's happening and then while he's kind of going out there and you know he meets up you know with his his uh, boyfriend you know in, in his universe but this isn't the same person uh, it's the same person, but not the same version. Right. And so he goes in there, he's having conversations with him, picking his brain, you know, you kind of see firsthand of like, Hey, look like this, this isn't a good thing. Most people are scared and uh, you know, it's, it's not that great of a world, even though everything's quieter and there's less crime. Um, you know, it's, it's not that, not that great of a world. And you know, the, and you have, um, Damien following him, trying to find out like, Hey, What's he up to? Who's he talking to? You kind of see Damien and John's exchange earlier um, in the issue. Um, and then and you kind of have, you know, uh, everything going from there. But I did like the interactions with him and the alternate version of his boyfriend uh, being like, hey, you know, part of me wants to kiss you, but I can't because, um, you know, it feels like it'd be cheating. And him being like, you know, that I can tell, you know, my version's very lucky or the other version of me is very lucky. And, and so you get all that, but then you kind of see Damien come in and you're kind of left to wonder, you know, what's he going to do? Is he going to torture this guy? Is he going to capture him? Is he going to do something else um, to try to figure it out? But, you know, in the, the number five preview, um, it kind of does tease, you know, super sons back together. Um, And so, so, so I think it'll be kind of cool to see, um, you know, them, them getting together and being, uh, you know, in this new universe and kind of what impact they'll kind of have on each other, um, you know, with how they, how they're approaching everything with what's going on around them. He does get the, uh, flash of blue energy again, when, uh, the bat insurgents are, you know, trying to tackle him down. Oh Yeah. Yeah. He's, he's a uh, Superman blue for a little bit longer now. And, uh, I, I hope they're going to, uh, continue with that, you know, and, and expand on it more because I, uh, I do like the idea of him, you know, being the, uh, Superman blue, you know, being a really different version of Superman compared to the, uh, you know, Clark Kent, uh, uni- uh, Superman. And he automatically trusts this other group. It's pretty cool. As soon as he sees Alfred, he's like, I know you guys are good guys. Like, yeah. as as, I thought that was pretty cool. Oh yeah. Good point. Yep. All right. Our next book that we had was Flash number 800. This is a, another anthology book. A lot, when it, a lot happened in the book. A lot of uh, individual stories. Um, really fun story to start it off with. Uh, why do heroes or why do villains stay away from Central City? Um, and it just talks about how no matter what, the Flash is always there before you can get it get out of town before you can get away um goes into a story about um 
more to uh, stealing a lollipop from a kid. <laughs> and Flash just chases them throughout time, multiple different universes. Mordo's just jumping, trying to get away, trying to get away. And finally, Flash just catches them at the end of everything. Mordo's like, there's no way he can catch me here. And Flash is just there with his hand out saying, I'm going to go ahead and take it. I see in the condiment king's always a win, right? <laughs> he shows yes. he shows up and they uh, send him to Africa and it says it took him a year to get back home. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I really I also really like that Mordu story with the lollipop. It I, I thought that really portrays the character of the Flash very well and you know it had a sense of humor in it. So uh it, it was really uh, it was a nice story. Of course Flash shows up at the very end because uh, one of the uh, players at the poker game robbed a bank in Central City. <laughs> yeah, and they were like, "You did what?" And yeah, no, I, I really enjoyed it. You <laughs> know, get out of here. Yeah, I know. There's a lot of obviously, there's a ton of um, Flash characters, and so it's hard to kind of do justice of all of them. But I like how each one of these stories was kind of written by a prior um, um, Flash writer. Um, you know, different artists like it. It was really cool, like kind of how they pulled it all together and kind of celebrated him, like as they kind of work back up to Flash number one coming back out. The only thing that, that I kind of hate about this is Flash one doesn't come out till September. Um, yes. Yeah. So, uh, so you're, so we have a few months between, but, um, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of like, man, Flash is supposed to be fast, right? Like now we're waiting three months till we, till we get him to come back. So, that, that kind of stinks. But outside of that, you know, really, really enjoyed the the stories, liked how they showed impulse, um, you know, how they're like, oh, oh, shit, like this guy, like he has ADD. How are we going to get him on task? Um, but then he kind of shows that, hey, you know, when when the chips are down, like I'm going to figure out the problem. I'm going to get something going. So so really like that story as well. Now, I just wanted to interject something, you know, something interesting that I that caught my eye. Um you know the flash uh the new numbering will be you know it, it, they will get a new numbering with the new creative team uh so we'll get the flash number one but on batman 136 it says uh, legacy number uh 901 so they're on the one hand they're kind of you know like resetting the numbering but they're also um uh, counting onwards from the uh, legacy numbers so guys make up your mind i, I actually prefer to have the um I think that the number one indicates, you know, hey, we got a new story, new direction. Um, but while also tracking for major milestone issues. So we can get cool issues like this Flash 800 where that's you true. bring back all stars from, from the characters past to, to tell stories. You know, because uh, you had the uh, Joshua Williamson, uh, Barry story, uh, Barry and uh, Iris going in. Uh, just going on a date via the cosmic treadmill, and <laughs> yeah, you know they're gone for a couple minutes, and there's like, okay, let's go out as a family now. Um, Jeff John's doing Zoom things like he always does. I was probably I thought that was like the weakest story out of the bunch. Three, um, and then I think the last one was it was uh, Linda and Wally having a date night. And yes, he, uh, he 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 uh, he goes out and uh, between seconds, you know, where she looks at the menu or checks her watch or, you know, checks her phone or whatever, he goes out and saves a couple of people and you know runs around to the the other side of the world to, to just you know stop a crisis uh, happening over there. I thought that was uh, pretty funny, pretty cool, and uh, the way that they ended the date was pretty cool. <laughs> it was pretty funny too, you know, where. Uh, he storms back into the restaurant and, you know, trashes the entire place. And, you know, uh, Linda being like, okay, what happened to all the, you know, quality time that we were supposed to have? And you've been, uh, obviously you've been uh, running uh, away in between seconds to do your flash stuff. <laughs> but you could feel the sort of disappointment, but also, you know, pride sort of feeling from her in the, in that, in that ending of the, of the story. I thought that was pretty funny. Yeah, and then you have this set up for the uh, new Flash number one with this whole uh, Mirror Master kind of letting this being a conduit for this like intergalactic 
a tentacle monster to be seeping into this universe. So, yeah. Um, from what they described for the Flash number one, I'm uh, I'm a little bit worried, but uh, I will definitely give it a try. I love love the Flash, love the Flash comic book. So, up next, we got Shazam number two, um, which I thought was another really fun issue. Um, Mark Wade just. Uh, he's been on another level recently with all of the books he's been doing. Um, overall, you know, I, I think we got some very cool bits with uh, Psycho Pirate where Billy thinks that he's what's causing him to lose his stuff. Um, we yeah. have the Dinosaur Warrior. Uh, that was a fun one. <laughs> I, I was going to say, I was going to say, why didn't you bring up the dinosaur with a stack of paperwork, the, the, the notary guy or the lawyer guy, whatever? All right. <laughs> and he has a monocle too. He's a yeah, exactly. with a monocle. <laughs> I mean, if that doesn't sell you on the issue, I don't know what will. Uh, you have the Shazam family going, hey, Billy, like, what the hell was that? <laughs> uh, when he first shows up back to the house, um, then you have him going to the art museum, chasing down Psycho Pirate, just destroying all of these priceless pieces of art, uh, trying to prevent him from stealing the Mona Lisa. He yeah, does realize that it wasn't Psycho Pirate behind all of his, you know, aggressive behavior, ruining stuff, and we still don't know who's behind it. And, of course, at the end, he's saying he doesn't want to turn into Shazam again. Yeah. Still the mystery there. But, well, I think, didn't it show? Um, so I haven't read Shazam 2 yet. I, I just realized I totally missed it. But Shazam 1, doesn't it show the wizard Shazam inside the Rock of Eternity um, with somebody else after the Lazarus planet, basically kind of being all evil-like and kind of giggling to himself in the dark corners of it that he's going to get Billy? Yeah, and, and they actually touched on that. Uh, Freddy was exploring the Rock of uh, Eternity, and he stumbles upon a meeting between uh the these gods that are conspiring against uh billy and they all think that he's there to spy on him uh so and that just is a little quick two-page epilogue and then there's the epilogue with mary falling asleep that's going to lead into the uh night terror shazam book um so the next book we have on the docket here uh i was actually really really surprised by this book uh I went in thinking that it was not going to be very good, and I absolutely adored it. Uh, that was Steelworks number one. Uh, Boom is our uh, biggest Superman fan, and I think I think Berger agreed with that anyway. Uh, can you take us take us away with this one and talk us through the issue? Yeah, sure. Uh, well, like you said, I also really like the uh, this issue. It's a continuation from the, uh, uh, the the stories that we had from Action Comics, and it's about um, you know Steel trying to uh, protect the city with uh, new technology, working uh, with the Superman family. You know, opening the uh, the steelworks building, uh, um, uh, but also trying to empower like the ordinary citizen to uh, you know protect themselves if there is a uh, superhero supervillain uh, fight going on. Uh, at the same time, he is uh, you know declaring he is uh, hanging up the cape. Uh, he is uh, you know stop. He's going to stop being. Uh, steel uh and uh what i thought was um interesting was it kind of felt like he was actively trying to uh get rid of the uh uh superheroes you know like he, he was trying he was, he, it wasn't in a bad guy kind of way you know it wasn't like he's trying to uh, conspire against them or anything is what's just you know is is he's trying to uh have the the people of metropolis fend for themselves and not rely on the uh super family as much as they as they do so you know that that sort of felt 
weird-ish, but also felt, you know, sort of fresh and new, like that hasn't been done before. Uh, I like the uh, new villain, kind of like his version of Lex Luthor. Uh, there's this guy, I'm not sure what he's called again, but he he got his uh, company ruined by by steel, and now he's going to, you know, come back and uh, corrupt this this drunk uh, guy who had a uh, history with Steel, uh, who got fired by Steel or something. And, uh, you know, he turns him into a supervillain against his will. So I wonder where that's, uh, where that's gonna go in the, in the, in the next couple of issues. So yeah, it's, it's, uh, a lot of, a lot of stuff happened in this, uh, this first issue. What are you guys' uh, thoughts about it? I kind of liked at the very end of the book, uh, the little dossiers that uh, still works, I guess, why they are what they are. Yeah. It shows like all the biggest damage is done to the city. And the biggest one was the Doomsday Battle. And it yeah. said 200 plus casualties. And it cost them about 5 to $10 billion to rebuild after. The yeah, which is kind of like the, uh, you know, I think that the, uh, the uh, John Henry Ayers is using that as a justification for the for the things that he's doing. And, uh, you know, from a normal person point of view, it makes sense. You know, it, it would be nice to have the, like semi-indestructible buildings and, you know, personal protection devices in case of a uh, fight breaks out between Superman and Titano or Lex Luthor or whoever, you know, just to be able to to protect yourself a little bit better. I mean, you know, who wouldn't want to, uh, you know, who wouldn't want that kind of technology when you're living in, in Metropolis? And it's, you know, it's kind of funny that they haven't thought about that before. Yeah, so, you know, yeah, I kind ahead. of look at it, uh, so I'm seeing, and maybe I'm just looking too much into it, but I think there's going to be something play out with, you know, him and his technology and how it's going to somewhat backfire. I don't think it's going to pan out the way in his mind. He thinks it's going to. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's pretty much. Different. Yeah. And, and so, you know, like he's sitting here outlining all this. It, I, I do kind of like how it has multiple kind of little storylines kind of going with it. Right. Like his on and again, off again thing with Lana, you know, his, how his interaction and what it's going to be like when he talks to Superman and the super family, um, you know, his you know, relationship with Natasha and like how he's going to hang it up. Um, and then, you know, his dynamic against this other organization that, you know, they had kind of, you know, shut down and then it was sold to somebody else. And then that person's like, Hey, I'm going to, you know, use this person to kind of get back at steel and kind of, you know, throw the first stone. But, you know, overall, when I'm kind of looking at it and I'm like, okay, where, where are we going with this? Like what could be happening? You know, it just feels like in several storylines right now, whether or not you look at, you know, cyborg or world's finest, um, or steel, like it's kind of setting up this people versus, you know, AI or robots and or it's blatantly doing it right in world's finest. Um, but I feel like the other ones are doing it. And I, I, I guess maybe it's because that's like one of like the hot topics right now in normal news. And so it's like, hey, let's play off this kind of, uh, you know, thing in the back of everybody's mind of like, hey, what happens like Terminator, like Judgment style, Judgment Day style. Um, but but overall, I do like it. I, I did enjoy Steelworks. Um, again, love the art, love the writing. Um, I like how you can see multiple different kind of doorways in front of us on, you know, what are these interactions going to be like? Um, so it's doing a good job setting up the story. Did it, it's doing a good job of picking up where action comics came from. So I, I, I do really enjoy it so far. Yeah. I went in with super low expectations for this book. I thought it was going to be one that I maybe picked up two issues of and then just said, yeah, it's not for me, but, uh, I just thought it was really well done. Um, Especially coming from a guy who is a actor is is the writer of this book, um, and just his first time writing a comic book, and he turned out something with this much quality to it. I'm, I was really impressed. All right, the next book we have on our list, guys, is Green Lantern number two, or as I like to call it, uh, Top Gun Green Lantern. 
<laughs> uh, Benji, uh, what did you think of this issue? Can you break down some of the major beats for us and uh, just take the lead here, sir? Oh, yeah. I mean, I like Tom Cruise, uh, Hal Jordan a lot. You know, it shows him, you know, kind of getting back to basics. He's taking on the demolition team and he uses his ring to come up with like a spate fake spirit world to scare him and it shows him flying off and he's like ah, i like these kind of hijinks and you know he's flying around and then he starts flying back down to earth and he's uh, once again down on himself and it shows uh kilowog is there to give him a pick me up again and you know they're just talking back and forth and he's like you know how I've never seen a Green Lantern, you know, construct a ring out of just pure willpower. Like, you're one of the best, buddy. Like, get back out there and, you know, get back in the game. And then uh, we see Carol has a fiancé now. And Al Jordan has, you know, weaseled his way into being their pilot. And he's still, you know, trying to talk to her and, you know, being flirty Hal and you know the new fiance is like hey I kind of like him she's like that's what he does you know he's a manipulator you know he'll always weasel his way in and it showed they're flying you know he's flying the plane Hal goes back there to talk to her and the other pilot uh is calling out like Hal I need you back up here and it looks like they're headed directly into Night Terrors, Green Lantern 1. I say that I really like how they are portraying Hal Jordan. You know, it really feels like the old Hal Jordan again, you know, the uh, playboy uh, pilot uh, who's, you know, fearless, who's, you know, the greatest Green Lantern of all, you know, by forging his own ring yet again, and this time without uh, the uh, gauntlet of uh, Krona. Uh, so, you know, it just really shows uh, he is the best of the best. And uh, well, he's he he's having fun again, but he's yeah. also insecure. Like, that's his shtick that he has. Yeah. And, you know, uh, it seems that, you know, Hal and Kilowog are now like roomies or something. That's kind of funny how that will play out. And this is a cuss word we don't have to bleep out. He, Kilowog actually says bar flats. And he goes, whoa, language there, buddy. <laughs> yeah. I, I love that Hal worked his way up uh, through the company just over the course of one day. Uh, you know, he's starting off in like the mail room and then uh, he becomes the driver and then he becomes uh, the, the, the co-pilot. He just kind of just kind of works his way up through uh, all these different jobs over the course of the day to make yeah. sure that he can be on that flight. Yeah, they want you to know how it, a charming, essentially, he is. And, you know, Carol is the only one that really sees through that charm. Come on, we all know that he's going to end up with Carol again. You also got to love him uh, pulling the little side-to-side uh, -side maneuver to make uh, Carol's fiancé spill the drink on himself and then he casually locks him in the bathroom so he can have time to chat Carol up. Um, and then we also had a uh, backup in this issue uh, that's going to be leading into the John Stewart uh, solo series that's going to be coming on sale in, uh, I think, October is when it's going to be uh, being launched. But it just talk, shows them on Earth, and then it kind of goes and shows a future where he's became this new, like, ultimate champion of the Green Lantern Corps. Uh, shows him fighting side by side with a uh, lantern we've, ne we've never seen before against this threat known as the Revenant. Uh, really interested to see where that goes. I'm excited to see that that book launch. Uh, did you guys have any thoughts on the backup? Yeah, I thought it was pretty cool how, uh, you know, it ended up being John being uh, inside the uh, new power battery, you know, him sacrificing himself to to be the the, the power battery for the core and then, you know, it kind of got, you know, blasted open and he, he steps out and he's, you know, like in full green uh, armor or whatever you want to call it. And, you know, he's like, you know, you're the last of the lanterns. Is there some kind of oath that we have to, to say? And then they have this new oath that they 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 uh, they speak out loud and 
you know, really looks like they're uh, ready to go and uh, kick some uh, behind. This other Green Lantern looks like Guy Gardner's cousin, like his younger cousin with a faux hawk or something. <laughs> yeah, who knows? Like Dude Gardner or something like that. <laughs> um, all right, let's let, let's keep everything moving. We still got uh, another six books to hopefully file through here, guys. Oh um, wow! So Berger, I know you've been loving the uh, We Are Legend books. Uh, can you go ahead and break down Spirit World number two for us? Yeah, so it, you know, continues to pick up, you know, with it, it kind of picks up where uh, issue one kind of ended right with uh, I forget what was the main girl's name, um, um, Xanthi. Yeah, Xanthi, kind of like her interaction with family. Um, you know, they end up being able to um, find a way to try to get back to the spirit world. So everything her and John are trying to do is get there. They kind of get sidetracked and kind of reminiscing some with family. Um, you know, she runs into, you know, her sister after that. And, and so it's, so it's kind of some good moments, but you can tell like it kind of has her on edge a little bit. Um, and then they end up, you know, kind of making their way like on this kind of between um, pathway between um, human world and spirit world. Um, and so as they're kind of heading down there, they have, um, like the shades of, um, Constantine's the extras of Constantine. Yeah. yeah. Like all kind of start popping up and, and so he's kind of like, okay, what do we do? And she's like, we just keep going. We got to make it to the end. We can't let, um, we can't get stuck here with all them. Um, you know, they're all kind of converging into one. Um, and then finally they kind of pop out. Um, on the other side and then you have this like you know like tentacle monster that was all those shades like coming together to kind of make their way through it so um so again you know, i like it uh, big fan of uh, i said earlier big fan of the artwork and all these the storyline how it's building new characters how it's doing a good job of kind of um not just establishing them but kind of telling their their backstory while they're kind of building the current story that's going on. Um, and so, yeah, so I, I, I did like uh, spirit world uh, number two. I, I was just going to say one moment that I really appreciated in this book uh, in particular was uh, Sandy's uh, uh, realization that the thing that was keeping her tied to the uh, real world was her little sister that was born after she passed away. Uh, her parents kind of forgot about her after she she died. Not necessarily forgot, but stopped going and giving paying respects to her. But her her sister just kept going back and and uh, helped her uh, remain in uh, the consciousness of the uh, the real world, which I thought was a really nice touch. You know, her sister that never met her uh, cared enough about her to uh, go and do that for her. Yeah. Uh that, that that was a touching moment. I just wanted to point out that, you know, last time we were talking about how Xanthi didn't really have a uh, superhero no, superhero name, but uh, it turns out that Xanthi kind of is her superhero name because her real name got you know blurted out in the in this issue. So we don't really know what her name is. Uh, we do know that she did die as a, a as a young child, and you know that like Hawkeye said that they had another child and. That was her tether to the uh, to the real world. Uh, I thought it was kind of messed up that her mother was kind of uh, holding her hostage in her own house, uh, which, on the one hand, you know, it would make sense if you get your long dead child back uh, somehow. I guess you would, you know, do anything to keep him or her uh, with you for as long as you can. But you no, know, it still felt kind of. And uh, the last thing that I wanted to point out was that uh, there was a big reveal uh, with uh, the uh, Cassie uh, story arc that we had in the book, uh, because uh, it turns out that Cassie, as you know, she's been fighting uh, demons in the spirit world, and it, uh, it was revealed that uh, she's uh, died before. Uh, and I guess we'll find out where and when that happened and how she got back. Uh, so hopefully that will come to a resolution in this uh, spirit world book. 
Mr. Digi, did you have any uh, thing to add on Spirit World number two? Uh, no, I think you guys summed it up pretty, pretty nicely. All righty. Uh, moving on, we had World's Finest number 16, which is uh, something Berger referenced earlier. Um, Berger, did you want to give us a summary of this issue and give us your thoughts? Yeah, so you kind of, you see the cliffhanger from the prior one, right, of, you know, like all the machines kind of going haywire, um, robots and everybody, you know, kind of rising up. And so, you know, you see, you know, kind of here, you see uh, Robin get saved, you see the, you know, heroes all kind of come together. um, And then you kind of start to figure out more of like the backstory, you know, all these uh, geniuses are kind of pulled together. Um, and you know, how new Mezo, which again, that name is ridiculous. Um, but how, uh, <laughs> how new Mezo kind of came to be, um, you know, kind of you know, how, how powerful he is and you know, how now you don't have just a robot that can duplicate powers, but you have a, like a, a real Android that can not only duplicate powers, but can also duplicate uh, the intellect um, and intelligence from others. And so oh, how- yeah, that's why they brought Will Magnus in, because Ivo never had the touch of yeah. it, the intelligence that the metal men had. For sure. So he he got I or Magnus to help with this new Mezo. Oh yeah. Yeah. And so so it was it was cool, like you know, you see the metal men, it kind of explains how they're different than the other robots and the other individuals that are kind of getting pulled up. But ultimately you kind of towards the end, like you kind of get the feeling like, Hey, you know, the heroes are, are gaining somewhat of an upper hand. Um, you know, you had some of the people that were being held hostage kind of rise up to try to, um, take out the, uh, what was the element man's opposite that android ultra uh, ultra Ultra morpho Morpho. yeah Yeah. that's right Um, equally as awesome as new maze exactly (laughs) um so you have so you have them all kind of rise up and and try to get it to where superman can can get free um heroes show up you feel like they're getting like the like a leg up and everybody's kind of like oh where'd this new maze go um and then for some reason new maze was waiting for all the other heroes to kind of go um, and, and get off and kind of progress and Batman stayed behind. So I have a feeling like Batman knew what was going on and we're going to see that in the, in world's finest 17 um, that, you know, Batman's like, Hey, I knew this was you. You, you were fake being Supergirl, um, whatever. And, and so it's kind of building up on it, but you know, like I, I, I've enjoyed this series so far. I do think they're leaning really heavily into like this whole human versus machines and AI thing and several of the storylines. Um, and it'll be interesting to see if somehow like they kind of connect in ways or something, but yeah, I, I've, I, I've liked it. I, I think I do like the fact that we're getting new versions, kind of what we're seeing in like the Superman books and some of the others, we're getting new versions of some of these big bads um, and we have to kind of think of new ways and overcome this to be able to get them. But um, in some ways, it kind of feels a little lazy as well. I, I like that when Ollie, because they had to get Superman's collar off to get his strength going. So <laughs> Ollie hits Ultra Morpho. And my favorite part, because I'm a big Firestorm fanboy, is he actually comes and holds him from reassembling back together, you know, while Superman can get his strength back. Oh, yeah. I, I did like right. seeing Firestorm as well. What I liked about that moment, it was it ties in, into your moment, uh, uh, Digi. It was, uh, you know, it was Green Arrow was in his civilian clothes. You know, he was uh, adopted as Green Arrow because you know, uh, New Mezo wanted to use uh, the the money from the billionaires to to you know get this venture going. And uh, you know, Bruce says to to Oliver, you know, you you just have to make the shot, you know, to disable uh, uh, Ultra Morpho. And he has to nail the shot, this this impossible shot he has to take. And then Batman says to to Ollie, like, you know, we'll just uh because Ollie was 
worried about revealing his uh, his identity, and then you know Batman says, "We'll just uh, we'll just uh, I'll, I'll just show up, and uh, people will think I I made the shot." And Ollie was like, "Yeah, right. That like that's gonna happen." I thought that was pretty funny. Yeah, no, that was a great moment. It definitely got a chuckle out of me. Yeah, um, and and uh, and I uh, and I loved seeing Hog Guy in the issue. Uh, Hog Man, sorry. Yeah, I was gonna say I I don't think I'm making any cameos lately. Cameo, Hawkeye, <laughs> cameo. We in we know if you were in the book, Hawkeye, you would have absolutely already handled this Ultra Morpho, um, and oh. New Mazo thing. They they wouldn't even be on there anymore. Maybe you would come yeah. up with better names for them. <laughs> hey, I just want to point out you guys are complaining about Ultra Morpho when Earth Three Superman is known as what guys? Mm, Ultraman. He is Ultraman. Yeah. As a Superman fanboy, guys, don't throw uh, uh, stones inside your glass house there. You guys accepted that one. You guys have got to accept Ultra Mazo. Um, and by the way, Burger, I 100% agree. I'm honestly going to be a little bit disappointed if Batman didn't know that that was new Mazo at the end. So uh, overall, you know, I, I think Mark Wade just flexing on both of the books he's writing. He's just uh, hitting on all cylinders. Um so going in, speaking of uh, AI, we had sideboard number two. Still not really feeling this book. How, how about you guys? Hey, uh, you know, what we wanted was Cyborg to have a supporting cast and a villain. And it turns out it's all his dad. So we called that <laughs> one. I'm not sure he's, he's the villain, but um, yeah, like you said, Hawkeye, I'm, I'm not really feeling it yet. I mean, um, I kind of like the, the the way it started with, you know, the questions that his father had about the soul and, you know, if it is, uh, you know, if you can somehow download it somewhere or, you know, save it or, you know, kind of questioning the uh, the ethics about that. Um, but other than that, it didn't really move past the daddy issues. It kind of enhanced them because, you know, Cyborg absorbed the the robot or the AI that his father uh, represented. And it's, it, it seems to be just moving in the same direction. Uh, his father did something, as it turns out, at the end, he has some sort of code or something that's, you know, it's probably not, not nothing good. And... Um, doesn't really seem to move past the, uh, the stuff with his father. So I, I don't think this, this book will have a very long run, but, you know, I could be wrong. Well, I always try to put that positive spin on it, right? I like his jacket. Is that that's a positive? <laughs> that's something. <laughs> I, I think personally for me, this maybe has two more issues in it. I'm ready to punt on it unless it picks up uh, somewhere. You know, uh, going into our next book, uh, for everything that Cyborg number two was not, Nightwing number 105 definitely was. Um, this book is a, is definitely one of the most interesting things uh, I've seen in a comic book since some of the stuff. Oh, yeah, hey, uh, guys. On Flash. Real quick, my comic book guy was supposed to get me a variant version of this book. I forgot to get the regular copy so i have not actually read this book so i'm you're on your own on this one <laughs> all right Digi. um well th this book is completely from nightwing's point of view it is a uh, day and a mission in the life of nightwing um as she starts up he's waking up uh laying next to barbara making some making some pillow talk and then bitewing comes jumping in his face uh, gets up starts getting ready it's a phone call. It's a sister. There's a biological weapon loose in uh, Bloodhaven. So the, Barbara and Dick get ready in a hurry, and then they start uh, making their way towards this uh, biological weapon. They land on the train. There's a nice little moment where Barbara kind of teases them because Nightwing knows how all of the trains and public transit runs in Bloodhaven, and she's like, just how much, what percentage of your brain do you you uh, dedicate to public transit. Then she also, Barbara misses her jump and Nightwing says, yeah, you got to calculate for for both the uh, train speeds. 
then we get one half of the superhero team, Double Dare. They have a nice little chase scene, and then they talk with her, and they find out that her and her sister are stealing a, a, a vaccine. And they decide that to infiltrate where she's being kept, that Barbara's going to pose as the other Double Dare sister. Uh, there's a missile that gets fired, train gets derailed, they catch Barbara, Nightwing gets away uh, with the um, other half of Double Dare. They go into an office building, which uh, I don't know if uh, Boom Stan or Burger noticed this. Uh, did you? you definitely haven't since you read it. So is uh, Mark they, Summers on the Double Dare team? That's my only question. <laughs> no, different Double Dare, different Double Dare. Uh, but the office that they they uh, crash into is actually the office from the television show. Um, oh wow! Oh, so no, I, 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 I didn't notice that. I did. I did not so, notice it either. So if you look, you can see Phyllis. You can see Dwight, Kelly, Jim, uh, Stanley, Angela, Meredith, Creed. Uh, you can see Ben and uh, Daryl, and then Cameron, who was played by Rashida Jones in the earlier seasons. Uh, they all pop up in this issue. So, Dundler Miffin, or Dundler Miffin, Miffin uh, is, is came into the DC universe, in case you guys were wondering. Well, that's pretty um, awesome. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You <laughs> can't. Yep. Yeah, I'm looking at it right now. That's uh, cool. Then, then Nightwing shows up to save Barbara, and she's already gotten herself out of trouble. Nightwing summoned into the office of a pharmaceutical company where, where she was being kept. And it is actually the, I believe his name's Heartless. Is that correct? I'm trying to remember. It is. Heartless. That's he's right. A, he's the CEO of this pharmaceutical company. And the vaccine that they've been chasing down, they are just trying to pump up the price of it. And that's why Double Dare stole it, because they were trying to deliver it to a country that could not afford it. Um, so Nightwing ends up purchasing the vaccine on behalf of that country, uh, make sure everybody gets paid, and then... Him and Barbara leave. There's some more uh, more banter between the two of them that definitely gave me a laugh. Uh, but overall, just a really cool issue. Really, really uh, awesome uh, idea for the issue. So I just definitely uh, enjoyed it. And I just, sorry, Breger, I'm going to steal your line. Actually, Breger, you go ahead and do it. Uh, that last line on the uh, notes. No, you go for it. So uh, Heartless was calling uh, Nightwing Mr. Wing. Uh, in their whole entire uh, interaction, and Nightwing, as he's walking out, he's like, "It's all one word. It's Nightwing." That'd be like me calling you Mister Hole. <laughs> yeah, that was my line actually, but it's fine. Oh my bad, my bad. I, I saw the break there. I thought that that, that was Burger taking over. Um, but yeah, just really good issue. Really love this run. Uh, Tom Taylor can do no wrong right now. Yeah, totally agree. I. Uh... I really love this issue. Yeah, it, it, it was just that the only thing that I thought was a little bit weird was the, the speech bubbles for uh, Nightwing. You know, they, they had like a weird blue kind of glow around it, which in my mind made it feel like like a telephone call or like a dream or like it was talking through a microphone or something. Uh, I guess it was, you know, just had something to do with, you know, identifying the, 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 the speech bubble as as Nightwings. Uh, but when I first saw it, it was... It, Felt kind of weird to me, like he was, like he so sort of lost his voice or something. But but I guess they did it to just indicate that that line was from Nightwing. All right, Burger, did you have any more thoughts on this issue? Oh no, yeah, I I enjoyed it a lot, and so yeah, I think you guys crushed it. All right, so we got two issues left here, guys. Um, the next one we have to tackle is Superman number five. Uh, Boom stamp, we got to do steel work. So I'm going to get this one to Burger. Burger, we break this one down, go over it, and uh, let me know what you thought of it. Yeah, so, you know, I liked, um, I liked the, well, I thought it was a little cheesy, but I liked like the whole montage of um, how Jimmy and Silver Banshee kind of met, um, fell in love, moved in and kind of all the experiences they had with it, um, you know, and, and, you know, you kind of like when you're sitting there looking at it, you're like, oh, you could easily kind of have like insert like almost any like 1990s or early 2000s, like rom-com um, like songs 
um, in there and have it playing while it's kind of going through that montage. So, so I, so I really liked that a lot and I liked how they continue to kind of build on some of these old, um, kind of villains of Superman, right? But I think that, you know, what I've kind of noticed with this issue is you're seeing like how these villains of old of Superman, um, how they've kind of turned over a new leaf and, you know, how you have them um, trying to be better for themselves and for their families um, and, and whether or not that's, an impact on, you know, just kind of what age and maturity comes from or, you know, Superman's impact on them. Um, but whenever you look at, you know, all of these ones like Metallo, you know, trying to be just a better person for his sister, trying to serve his time, then kind of everything that comes out of it. And then now, you know, Silver Banshee, you know, trying to, you know, just live a normal life. Um, you know, really not wanting to do the things that she's doing, but, you know, she's do only doing that because, you know, her loved ones, you know, Jimmy Olsen, um, you know, basically are being threatened. Um, but I, but I like that. And then what I really kind of like is, is this game of chess that's kind of forging, um, between the new big bads, um, and, and Superman and Lex team, right? So you have pharma and uh, was it graft? Graft, yeah, graft. Yeah, graft. And so you have, you know, them kind of playing this really intricate game of chess. It's like, hey, we're going to move these things on the board in order to, you know, be like two or three moves ahead, which you don't normally see that happen w against Superman, or much less a Superman and Lex pairing up, um, right? And so. Basically, they manipulate events to get Silver Banshee there. They knew, you know, Silver Banshee would have to kind of somehow purge herself and scream really loud, um, thus having a domino fall of Superman's hearing um, being impaired. Um, and then again, like we mentioned earlier, like it does, I think it does a good job of kind of showing Superman kind of relaxing in this moment and saying, hey, I can actually be in this moment, I don't have to drown out all these other things that are going on around me to focus on you. I can actually just focus on you in this moment. And so I, so I really, really enjoyed that, you know, again, kind of bringing that human side and all the responsibility and the weight of the world that, that Superman is, is always holding. Um, but then it all kind of leads to the next domino, which now that he can't hear, um, it leaves Lex really vulnerable. And so you see Lex kind of talking to himself, um, kind of admitting that, you know, he he was on the wrong side and looking at Superman wrong this whole time. Right. And um, and and really being like, what would it have been like if we would have partnered up back in Smallville? And 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 so I think that was like really powerful. You see him kind of walking, but he doesn't realize he's necessarily talking to himself because he doesn't realize Superman can't hear. And, and then, you know, the, again, the new big bads use this as a way to kind of get Lex in the wrong part of the prison, um, leaving him exposed to being attacked. And then at the end, you kind of see him laying on the ground being like, Superman, you know, please help. Um, and you know, kind of just saying those things, trying to get that help again, not realizing that Superman can't hear him. And so, so again, I, I, I'm a really big fan of this um this this storyline and kind of how they're using the the old villains in in new ways um and how it shows kind of their their change um and then you know kind of how it's superman and lex's um how how their dynamics changed um and then how how these new big bads are just thinking two or three steps ahead Hey, is it me or is Silver Banshee kind of hot now? I mean, <laughs> and I kind of want to hear her single bow ties. It shows like <laughs> one, two, three, four, bow ties <laughs> during their double day. Yep. Sorry, but, you know, I, I have to talk about this issue. I also really love this issue. I, re I really love the whole Superman run, actually. I mean, they, the, the, 
art and uh, writing team just, you know, been knocking it out of the park. I really liked how Jimmy stepped up, you know, from being, you know, the uh, Superman's pal, you know, the sort of like nerdy kind of kid and, you know, just, you know, grabbing the uh, the jetpack and uh, going after to save his uh, his girlfriend. I really liked the pairing of, of him and Banshee. Um, he actually and, says, hey, pal, you're going to say you wouldn't yeah, go after somebody kinda, you love. <laughs> exactly. He kind of stands up to Superman about it. I really like that. It really shows him uh, growing, you know, being a little bit more mature. Uh, I really liked the date night that they that they had. I really liked the the uh, the walk for with Lois and Clark uh, going to to the date. You know, uh, Lois expressing her concerns about what's happening, and you know them talking about it, and you know talking about how he lost his hearing and everything. Uh, like Berger said, that leads to uh, the bad guys being able to get close to to Lex Luthor and stabbing him. Uh, you know, trying to kill him. Um, and I kind of I wonder if this will uh, lead Lex down the dark path again. You know, he's, he's been uh, pretty much uh, on Team Superman from 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 the get go. But you know, this failure from from Clark or from Superman to to save him, even though it's not really his fault, uh, might lead Lex into hating him again because you know Superman wasn't there for him when he got stabbed in prison. So you know that may may be something that uh that that will uh that, that that they'll get back to into into the the next issues on the other hand i would like to continue the lex and uh superman team up and i just wanted to you know point out that we saw this new character again which we don't know really don't really know anything about yet, just yet it's this uh marilyn moonshine she's been uh looking in on lois and clark when they were headed for the for the date night and you know, we still don't know if she's a, a force for good or for evil, but uh, I guess we'll uh, we'll find out. All right, guys, we are at the tail end here. We have one book left to go over. It is DC's uh, premier book right now. It's the new Justice League. It's the Titans. Um, Digi, do you want to do this book for us? Yeah, uh, well, it starts off with a flashback of... The younger team, you know, the original Team Titans team taking on uh, or heading to the battle with Brother Blood. And it shows the Justice League has already been there. They've already wrapped it up like super quick. And, uh, you know, Wally and Dick are having a conversation. He's like, hey, do you ever think we're going to be, you know, better than, you know, as good as the Justice League? And of course, Dick Grayson goes, we're going to be better one day. So then they flash forward to, you know, where we left off, where you see Wally West is quote unquote dead. Uh, he got shot in the chest and he tries to call Linda and lo and behold, he's like, well, she didn't answer, but Wally did and Wally's there in the present. So it's showing a future Wally was the one that was murdered. Uh, Nightwing's concerned. Uh, they get a call that there's what, uh, fires in Borneo. So he wants to send the team. Wally uh, wants to go and he's like, hey, I want to you know, go there. And Dick's like, no, you're going to stay here with me, pal. We're going to figure out this mystery. And he tells Donna Troy, hey, I want you to lead the team. You're going to go there. They go and kind of they save the people. They kind of do a, you know, from these echo terrorists and get things to calm down. They save the day and get, you know, it shows the team back, back at Titan's Tower. They're trying to set things up, get things back to normal. And um, Donna and Starfire kind of have a little conversation. Like, are you mad that, you know, Dick chose me to lead the team. And she's like, no, you're a great tactician, Donna. You know, I'm, I'll follow you anywhere. And from there, there, what, you know, Beast Boy looks bored. So Cyborg goes over there, hooks the TV up, and they see Brother Blood come out on a talk show. And of course, now he's not going by Brother Blood. He's going by Brother Eternity. And he wants to, you know, 
he wants your money, but he's saying, hey, we're not charlatans. We're not a fake religion. We're going to use this money. And to show, you know, how in good standing we are, we have one of the Titans has joined us. And you see Garth, a.k.a. Tempest there with them. And he is like, see, this guy has joined us. And, you know, as we saw in Titans 1, Garth had told them that he couldn't join them. So we're probably certain that he's under some kind of mind control or even if that's the real Garth. But we still have the mystery of who shot Wally, you know, who was close enough to get him, you know, as the still unsolved mystery. Okay, yeah, I liked how they had, um, you know, as Wally's there, like he's like, hey, I want to go out and help. And they're like, they start tying clues, basically making it seem like that Wally getting shot isn't that far in the future. Um, they're like, no, like we picked up, you know, Ash and, you know, I, I think it was trees or something, you know, on your on on the suit. And so you're you're definitely not going to this fire um, to go put this out over there. You're going to stay here with us. So. So and and you know one thing that I really dig is um, you you see a real clear path forward on this and you see all these different things of um, that that's kind of playing out in in this Titan. So you have multiple kind of storylines. You know, Titans versus U.S. government with like Peacemaker, Amanda Waller, um, all of them. You have Titans versus brother brother eternity um and then you you really have like um titans versus like you know what's happening with wally and so so i think it's kind of cool how there's multiple storylines going um again like i've been a really big fan of this book um and and uh, the issue so far so I'm, i'm really really liking the way it's going one moment I really want to point out that I liked was uh, the little interaction between Donna and Starfire after the uh, the Borneo mission where uh, Donna's like, hey, yeah, I want to address that. You know, Nightwing put me in charge. And Starfire's just like, shut up. You're a great leader, great tactician. If you're leading, I'm following. I, I just thought that was a nice little touch and kind of showed uh, their growth from their time as the Titans. Yeah, Unity and the team, they don't really have that power struggle that the Justice League always had. Maybe less egos on this team. Cool. All right, so <clears throat> this was a um, obviously great time, as always, hanging out with you guys and uh, being able to uh, spend time talking about all the things that we love.